Well, my name is Roger Bridges. I was educated in the 50s and 60s in the heart of the Civil Rights era. I have a PhD from the University of Illinois in American History and for many years was <clears throat> the uh, director of the Illinois State Historical Library, now known as the Abraham Lincoln uh, Library and Museum. And then I spent another 15 years in Ohio being a <clears throat> director of the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Center. My interest has long been in African American history. For years, white Americans assumed African Americans were universally grateful for the magnanimity of the great emancipator. In recent years, African Americans have become increasingly ambivalent about Lincoln and his commitment to emancipation. And that's what I want to talk about today. More than 30 years ago, my own naivete ended. I had boldly asserted at a national meeting of American historians, it is ironic that Illinois, the state from which Abraham Lincoln was elected president, had some of the nation's most repressive black laws that were even more restrictive than those of its sister states in the old Northwest. Well, a young black assistant professor proceeded to lecture me for nearly 20 minutes about the shortcomings of the honky president. He denied Lincoln deserved credit for emancipation or for slavery's demise. How have African Americans understood the Emancipation Proclamation and Lincoln's role in emancipating nearly four million slaves? A document, as we heard yesterday, that has been called by many the most important document in American history, while others characterize it otherwise. When the Confederate guns fired on Fort Sumter, African Americans, such as Frederick Douglass, H.O. Wagoner, John Jones of Chicago, were disappointed that Lincoln had failed to incorporate emancipation as a cause for the Civil War. They were even more disappointed when Lincoln forced Generals John C. Fremont and David Hunter to rescind their emancipation orders. His actions, African Americans assumed, meant that Lincoln did not intend to emancipate the slaves. And as Edith Green Medford has recently observed, even when Congress enacted emancipation in the District of Columbia, an area where Congress clearly had the right to legislate, Lincoln delayed five days before signing the bill. This delay, she said, indicated that he was at best a reluctant emancipator. More importantly, it gave owners five days to get their slaves out of the district. But the most strident critic, of course, is Lerone Bennett, Jr. The African-American writer, editor, and historian who as early as 1968 and repeated in his book just mentioned, the testimony of 16,000 books and monographs to the contrary, notwithstanding, Lincoln did not emancipate the slaves, greatly or otherwise. As for the Emancipation Proclamation, it is not a real Emancipation Proclamation at all and did not liberate African-American slaves. Clearly, there are statements made by Lincoln during the Lincoln-Douglas debates that indicated he was no friend of the black man. But Lincoln's statements are taken out of context and are not always understood. Free, Amer free African Americans had been celebrating others' freedoms since Toussaint Louverture had led the successful revolution that led to Haiti's independence in 1804. Their desire for freedom had also been demonstrated by the thousands of slaves who joined the British Army during the American Revolution. They rejoiced again with the British 1834 West Indian Emancipation. They celebrated for many years August 1st as Emancipation Day. Chicago's John Jones argued forcefully in 1847 that African Americans were entitled to freedom because neither the Declaration of Independence nor the Constitution mentioned color. He argued persuasively that African Americans were citizens by right. About that there is abundant evidence. I need not attempt to establish our natural rights, but it may be instructive to glance at the history of our country. By examining the journals of Congress, you will find that it provided that 
the free inhabitants of these states shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of the free citizens of the several states. Throughout the antebellum years then, African Americans celebrated both British emancipation and more importantly, Toussaint Louverture's uh, led Haitian Revolution. The nomination and election of Abraham Lincoln fueled black aspirations that their thraldom would soon end. Still, there were those who feared that he would not loosen their bonds. Chief among those were two Douglases, one well-known, the other not so well-known. Even, uh, even before Lincoln's election, Frederick Douglass had declared that while he supported the Republican Party, he could not support the Illinoisan for president. This Douglas found Lincoln's profession of antagonism toward slavery inconsistent because he supported enforcement of the fugitive slave law when he vowed not to touch the South uh, peculiar institution and when despite his avowal of the humanity of African Americans, he upheld the right of white people to discriminate against blacks in a variety of ways. The other Douglas, Hezekiah Ford Douglas, born in Virginia, moved to Chicago in 1858 and had witnessed the 1858 Lincoln-Douglas debates. H. Ford shared Frederick's dislike and distrust of Lincoln. Thus, both Douglases campaigned vigorously against Lincoln in 1860. With the coming of the Civil War, Civil War uh, African Americans became more hopeful. They realized, despite Lincoln's repeated assertions that he would enforce existing laws, that their bondage would soon end. Long before the Emancipation Proclamation made freeing the slaves a war aim, African Americans were calling the Civil War a war for freedom. Indeed, as historian James Oakes has recently <coughs> uh, observed, Emancipation had begun as early as the first contrabands were recognized as such in Maryland by General Benjamin Butler. George E. Stevens, a black correspondent of the weekly Anglo-African and an army cook, predicted that emancipation would be the inevitable result of the war. But African Americans waited impatiently for the Lincoln administration to acknowledge that the war was for emancipation. Although they were eager to enlist, they were rebuffed by Lincoln's army. Historian Eric Foner recounts the story of Henry Jarvis, a Virginia slave who escaped early in the war. His attempt to enlist was rejected by General Benjamin Beast Butler, saying it wasn't a black man's war. Jarvis responded to Butler that it would be a black, war, black man's war before they got through. In the meantime, they waited impatiently and complained about the Lincoln's administration's failure to accept the inevitable. Finally, on April 16th, African-American dreams began to reach fruition. On that day, Lincoln signed into law a bill emancipating the slaves in the District of Columbia. African-Americans and, ab and abolitionists applauded the act. At a public meeting in Terre Haute, Indiana in May, the people of color met at the AME Church for the purpose of returning a tribute of thanks to Almighty God for the late act of emancipation. They passed resolutions thanking Congress for passing the act and praising Lincoln for the Emancipation Proclamation. On the first anniversary of that act, African Americans gathered at the 15th Street Presbyterian Church, a colored church. It was, according to a correspondent, an Emancipation Jubilee to celebrate the anniversary of the signing of an act which made the District of Columbia a free territory. One of the speakers, J. Willis Menard, formerly of Randolph County, Illinois, effused, of all of the presidents, the name of Abraham Lincoln would be heard in thunder tones in ages yet to come. In closing, Menard recited one of his own poems. Give liberty to millions yet neath despotism's sway that they may praise thee as we did one year ago today. O oh, guide us safely through this storm. Bless Lincoln's gentle sway. Still, the D.C. Compensated Emancipation Act left most slaves in bondage. African Americans continued to urge Lincoln to take action. <clears throat> he seemed reluctant, choosing instead, attempting to persuade the border states to accept the congressional carrot by colonization elsewhere, and the border states, of course, would not budge. <clears throat> 
most strident and angry at the delay was Frederick Douglass. He frequently used his favorite metaphor in calling for emancipation <coughs> and criticizing Lincoln. Slavery, he said, was the stomach of this rebellion. Cut off the connection between the fighting master and the working slave, and you at once put an end to the rebellion. Lincoln, of course, had already decided to issue the Emancipation Proclamation and was, upon the advice of his cabinet, only awaiting a Union victory to do so. <coughs> Again, as historian James Oakes has observed in his recent book, The Republican and the Radical, the best politician knows how to compromise just enough to arouse the constituency without forsaking basic details. No politician did this better than Abraham Lincoln. He maintained popular support for a terrible war <clears throat> by insisting that the only point of the war was a restoration of the Union. So he dissembled by using his famous response to Greeley's prayer of 20 millions, in which Lincoln wrote, and I'm not going to quote it because you've heard it several times. In that same letter, however, he gave a clue to those who wanted to see it. He wrote, I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. Although African Americans were disappointed by Lincoln's reply, William Wells Brown tried to put a good face on it in a West Indies Emancipation Day celebration in Boston. Wells observed that without a period of bloodletting, the American people would remain reluctant to free slaves. Following the victory at Antietam, Lincoln, of course, issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And while it shocked many white Americans, Frederick Douglass expressed disappointment. Had there been one expression of sound moral feeling against slavery, one word of regret and shame that this accursed system had remained so long, the disgrace and scandal of the Republic, one word of satisfaction in burying <coughs> in the hope of burying slavery and the rebellion in one common grave, and a, th a thrill of joy would have run around the world. But no such word was said, and no such joy was kindled. While the African-American response to the preliminary emancipation <coughs> was muted, or even disappointing, the reaction to the Emancipation Proclamation in January 1863 was wildly enthusiastic. <coughs> there were huge celebrations across the nation by black men. Two of them in Boston were attended by the lions of the day, Frederick Douglass, Charles Lennox Ramond, William Wells Brown, John Rock, and others. Even in Norfolk, Virginia, where the proclamation had no effect, some 2,000 blacks paraded through the streets. In honor of the occasion, John Willis Menard composed another poem entitled, To President Lincoln on Issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. Thou hast spoken, let the earth resound, with hallelujahs to our gracious God, the gladsome news, four million men will soon no longer groan beneath the tyrant's rod. May thy footsteps ever lead thee upward, upward to that bright celestial land where safety sheltered from the storms of life, thou join the heroes of the Patriots' hand, band. In addition to, freeing, to promising freedom to slaves <coughs> in the area still in rebellion, Lincoln, of course, invited African Americans to join the armed services. Eager to participate, African, Ameri uh, African Americans started trying to enlist but most northern states would not accept them. Massachusetts, however, accepted with alacrity and soon enlisted two regiments, the 54th and 55th, which included many black, sold, many black soldiers from Illinois. So, intense, so incensed by Lincoln's reluctance to raise one or more black regiments in Chicago, Chicago blacks called a war meeting at Quinn's Chapel and urged state officials to enlist African Americans. In their resolutions, they praised Lincoln's enlightened and just administration, through whom great things had been accomplished in the providence of God for the oppressed and the downtrodden. But they were prepared to endure now that the proclamation had been issued. In Springfield, Lincoln's good friend, William Florville, thanked and praised Lincoln in a letter saying, <clears throat> 
I and people and my people feel grateful to you. The shackles have fallen. Other African Americans continued to temper their enthusiasm for Lincoln as they saw little advance in their quest for equality and full citizenship. At an October 1864 National Convention, they expressed their doubts about the nation's commitment and Lincoln's ability to sustain his celebrated proclamation of the 1st of Je January, 1863. <coughs> As the war turned increasingly in favor of the Union and thousands of slaves streamed into the Union, African Americans' enthusiasm, however, for Lincoln and emancipation grew. Shaken by Lincoln's assassination, the colored citizens of Springfield passed resolutions of mourning for Abraham Lincoln, <coughs> and here I'm quoting, President of the United States, the great friend of the nation and benefactor of our race, who had fallen by a wicked assassination, by a wicked assassin, whose heart and hand had been made the tool of rebel, rebel hate and malice, and whose principles are based upon the degraded institution of slavery. The Reverend James H. McGee, a Shipman, Illinois relative, er, uh, resident, praised Lincoln, calling his death his race's greatest tragedy. At a meeting of colored men in Yorktown, Virginia in 1867, one D. Mort Norton, lately a slave, lauded Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States. I have not the words to express my feelings when I think of him. I know he was a president after God's own heart, a man who carried out the designs of his creator. He never faltered a moment, never shrank. I consider him my father, your father of everyone with a black skin. By 1870, however, particularly as African Americans continued to find obstacles in their journey to equality. In spite of the 15th, uh, 15th Amendment, or perhaps because of the necessity for it, their praise for Lincoln and the Republican Party began to wane. At the sixth anniversary of the issue of the Proclamation of Freedom in Chicago, William Wells Brown noted that an offer by the black man to aid in putting down the rebellion was met with a ref refusal, and the insulting reply that this was a white man's war. At the same celebration, Mr. Lewis B. White of Chicago, a young colored man of fine address, while acknowledging its benefits, considered that President Lincoln only issued the Emancipation Proclamation because he was compelled to do it in order to save the Union. And he also believed that the Negro had no one but himself to thank for freedom and liberty. He fought his way to it, and he alone deserved the credit of that great boon. <clears throat> These were not the only voices, however. On the anniversary of the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation in 1876, H.O. Wagoner, a veteran of Chicago's Underground Railroad, friend and associate of John Brown, Utilize, eulogized Lincoln, calling his proclamation the greatest event in the history of the colored race on this continent. He tempered his praise, however, with the caveat that there is one provision in this proclamation which is a living attestation of Mr. Lincoln's great magnanimity, that of giving the rebels 100 days in which to lay down their arms and thus save the institution of slavery. Generally speaking, African Americans continued to remember and praise <coughs> Lincoln as a benefactor to the race throughout the remainder of the 19th century. But the waning regard for Lincoln might be inferred from the appearance of Frederick Douglass in Lincoln's hometown on Emancipation Day in 1893. In the Illinois State Journal's account of Douglass' speech that evening, there is no indication that he mentioned Lincoln. His remarks were rather directed at the loss of rights by the people in what Rayford Logan and James Lowen has, have called the beginning of the nadir for African Americans. By 1898, the enthusiasm for celebrating Lincoln and emancipation was clearly declining. The crowds were disappointingly small when the colored folk of New York City celebrated the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation. At a, Decatur, at a Decatur, Illinois celebration in 1899, 
Mrs. Ida B. Well, Mrs. Ida B. Wells Barnett, the well-known anti-lynching crusader, told her audience on that Emancipation Day that the African race had long ago paid its debt of gratitude to the Republican Party. But even as African Americans were beginning to question their loyalty to the Republican Party because of Lincoln and his actions, uh, memory became more important. At a D.C. celebration on April 16, 1903, John C. Dancy, then one of the highest ranking black officials remaining, asserted that the memory of, Abra of Lincoln would grow more inspiring with each year because the nation, by reason of his policy, had come to be the center of the eyes of the nation of the world. Historian David Blight has observed Lincoln had always been a central part of African American emancipation celebrations in the desperate circumstances of the age of Jim Crow. He became even more important symbolically to black citizens, strategically and with genuine sentiment. Therefore, blacks honored Lincoln in season and out, but especially on days when they remembered, when they remembered their freedom as a national matter. As Blight has reminded us, by the turn of the 20th century, the Confederacy had won the battle of the books and the memory of the Civil War. African Americans had seen their role in the Civil War and the larger society relegated to the dustbin of history. Even though W.E.B. Du Bois had tried to reinvigorate the American memory about the importance of emancipation, and more importantly, tried to reclaim civil and political rights for his race, Americans at large would rather forget the tragedy of the war and the fact that a principal cause of that had been the southern slaveocracy's refusal to admit the sin of slavery. But while Du Bois and others were trying to reclaim the legacy of emancipation, the growing scientific racist thought led them to reduce their legacy of emancipation, their, led them <coughs> to reduce their praise for Lincoln. <coughs> Now the demise of slavery. Now the demise of slavery was increasingly seen as only an incidental, indeed reluctant, act of the Civil War. If the war was not for freedom and democracy and the right of all of its citizens, then Lincoln's role or contribution in securing that role was unimportant. Still, as late as 1960, Du Bois continued attempting to recall Lincoln's prestige and commitment to emancipation in order to reinvigorate the nation's conscience to little avail. So the environment was ripe for Bennett's strident falsifications about Lincoln and his racism. But if Bennett's views represent a portion of African American attitudes, it does not represent all. An alternate view has been expressed by the Honorable Jesse Jackson, Jr., now a congressman from Illinois. And let me quote briefly from his statement. I won't quote from his statement. Thank you. <laughs>